Jesus, Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. Good morning. We have come here to declare the name of Jesus Christ. The name above all names in which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
I actually wanted to read from the bulletin um, every Sunday. We, I don't know if you've noticed the, the opening of the bulletin. There's a little thing that says the passage, says, hey, that's me. Um, and then there's something called the shepherd to sheep. And as much as I spend the time prayerfully considering the word of God, I also pray, pray over what that passage and that part of the message. It's part of the message. And I wanted to read that um, because it leads right into what we're doing today. It says, Beloved. What a word that is. Beloved. It is beyond care and compassion. Even beyond just love. It is the intimate relationship we share with one another concerning our union with God, our Father, and the Creator of the universe. God so loved the world but he has called us to respond to his love to become Christians. And then it says, love, Pastor Ken. Yeah, that, that part too. That's good. Um, we are going to spend a little bit of time reviewing some things in the book of Revelation. Um, and then you'll, it says in here, the passage is Ruth 2. That, we're going to end with that part. So we'll be ending in Ruth. But we're going to start out in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation is the last book in the New Testament. Um, and we have been spending a little bit of time here on Sundays going through the book of Revelation. Um, frequently, I take notes. Um, I do actually use that part of the bulletin where there's notes on the back page. And... Um, Whenever I find something that just kind of inspires me or reminded of something, um, I write those things down on the notes. Um, and I found, as I was preparing for the message today, that um, I had notes from Revelation chapter 1 um, back in May. May 6th was when pastors started the first chapter in the book of Revelation. And it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. I mean, yes, we do go through every chapter um, as part of Calvary Chapel kind of thing, verse by verse, line by line. But to think May, June, July, August, September, now October, here we are six months exploring the book of Revelation, and we're not done yet. There's still another four or five or seven chapters um, left. And so I wanted to kind of start out and do a little review recap of some of those things that we have heard. Um, as we read through the book of Revelation, there are many things that are there. Some of the things are clouded in mystery and symbology and things that are just not clear and understood, even to us now. I mean, obviously back when the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John as he was on an island of Patmos by himself with Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, um, he wrote these words down. He had a vision of God and heaven and the future. And he wrote these things down, not understanding what he was seeing. I mean, imagine if he were to be looking at somebody with a cell phone and communicating with somebody. He would be like, wow, is that person praying? And then that thing is talking back to him. I mean, wow. You know, and just, just kind of imagining the things that we see are normal today. Voices and people on a big box talking at us um, in television and movies and, and all the other things of technology and how knowledge has increased as the Bible prophesied. And many times I've read through the book of Revelation. Many times I have been in teachings where I've heard the book of Revelation taught to me. And yet each time as I come to the word, there's always seems like something new that, that God through the Holy Spirit has chosen to remind me and teach me. Um, and so in the book of Revelation, I started to wa wanted to start out in chapter one, verse five. And here uh, John is writing uh, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Um, grace and peace to you. I wanted to pick up on the very last part concerning Jesus. To him who loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And this is the very first step in that process in which we have joined together with God, joined together with other Christians. The first step is that Jesus loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, because we are sinful and no man or woman can come to God with sin because God is a perfect and pure God. There is no way that we can even approach God. If you look at the Old Testament, you saw Moses. He even did not really see God so much. God said, turn your face into the rock, into the crevice of the rock, and I will pass by behind you. And, maybe, and you'll see a little bit of that glory. Um, and yet, even with that little bit of glory, Moses' face shined brighter than a light bulb because of the presence of God just being that near to him. And there were times in the Old Testament where the glory of God, the presence of God, was so strong that the people just ultimately fell to the ground their face to the ground because they could not even consider looking upon God or being face to face with him. And yet, because of Jesus Christ, because of him washing our sins, he has created us anew and made us white and pure and fresh and clean so that we can approach him, so that we can have a life with him. And this is that first step that Jesus did this task in loving us and through his love he washed us. I actually was planning and, and I forgot until yesterday I was going to do this little trick, this little gimmick. Um, recently um, my wife and I had gotten this box of some treats for our dogs and included in there was one of these little red plastic things and you remember little uh, decoder rings and decoder things, and they'd always have these little red little plastic thing that you'd look on, and you'd look through that red, and then whatever was hidden on the page, you would see it as clear as day. And I thought of that when I was thinking of this verse, because as red and stained we are with sin, because he washed us with his blood, which kind of like doesn't make any sense. You wash something with blood, you're going to get it blood, bloody, right? But instead, that blood washed over, and so the red of the blood became a filter to which he did not see the red of our stain. Just like those little decoder things, and that's how they work. And I was going to do a little, try a demonstration, but I forgot. So hopefully you can kind of imagine that, um, or you could go and try it at home. Um, and... And so there's, it's an amazing thing that to wash something in blood and then have it be, come out pure and white. Um, I, another little trick, and I'm just going to share this with you for you mothers or parents um, or even teachers. Um, I have made the mistake, and we, we have these whiteboards in our school where I write on, and they have special magic markers whiteboard markers, so when you write on them, there you can erase it. Well, a few times, I and others have written on there with an actual permanent marker, like a Sharpie by accident. And it's like you try washing it, you try doing whatever, and you cannot get that. It's kind of like that stain upon us. But if you take a whiteboard marker and write on top of where the magic, where the permanent marker is written, the chemicals in that dry erase marker will break down the chemicals in the permanent marker so that it becomes erasable. So if you didn't know that, that is a trick that works. So if you have something written on with Sharpie, you can take a white a dry erase marker and write right over it. And it'll then make it so that it can be erased. And that's kind of that same process that God has done with us that there's some characteristic in the blood of Jesus that causes the stain of our blood to be wiped clean. So that's, this is just kind of, you know, the first verse that I found that I wanted to talk about. Um, and so we've got this process 
that we had to have been washed before we can come to God. Uh, once we've been accepted into God's family, we are then declared to be overcomers by his blood. And so in chapter 2, we see the, the passage then as John is writing to the seven churches. And it talks here about overcomers. And you find all the way through chapter 2 and chapter 3, several times, actually like seven times, um, where it talks about overcomers. Now, the book of Revelation, at least in this part especially, is written to the seven churches. Now, the seven churches is symbolic of several different things. One, it's symbolic of the future churches um, that were yet to come from John's perspective as far as looking into the future. Some people look at that as symbolic of seven church ages in which the first church is related to the Jewish Christian church, where the seventh church is relating to the church that's current at the time of the book of Revelation when the whole wrath of God, the tribulation, and all of those things start. In other words, the seven churches relate to seven different types of churches that are active at that time as well as today you can go into other churches, and I remember doing that before I came to Calvary Chapel, going and visiting other churches, trying to figure out which church I should be a part of, and seeing these seven different parts of those churches that are active in the world today. Um, and some of those do contain actual Christians in those churches, as far as the buildings and the, the denominations or the non-denominational or the whatevers that are out there. Um, so these things that are written here can be construed to be applied to you as well as just the people in that church and the people in the seven churches throughout time or whatever. It's written to the church. And so the thing about this is because of the blood that has washed us and entered us into this process of being part of the family of God, we are overcomers. And so we can see these overcoming statements as declaring to us and again it's part of this process that God is declaring to us what it means to be an overcomer in Christ and so the first one is in Revelation 2 verse 7 and, and I, I think this is interesting the very first part of this verse kind of alludes to what I'm telling you right now it says for he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you have a spiritual ear, listen to what the, the Spirit of God is telling these churches because he's telling it to you too. It's kind of my interpretation of that. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. As overcomers, we have an inheritance with the Son of God. We read about that in many places in the New Testament, in the book of Romans in particular, it talks about how that we have been adopted as sons of God and heirs of the kingdom of God. And so like Jesus, we have an inheritance that is given to us for eternity to be with Jesus, to be with the Father in paradise, partaking of that tree of life and the eternal life with him. That's part of what we would call hope. When the Bible talks about the hope that is set before us, that's that hope of eternal life, that we have something beyond what we currently think of life now. And in fact, you read in the book of Hebrews how that Jesus, at the moment of his trials and tribulation and the beatings and the scorn and all those things, he looked with joy beyond to see this time now in which we would all be part of his family. And with that joy, he looked beyond the circumstances to be able to endure them until the end. And that's part of what we do is hope. Hope is one of those things that helps us to endure through the times that we are going through now, knowing that this is just temporary or temporal, as it is often said in the Bible. The next one we find is also in chapter 2, verse 11. And again, it starts out with, 
he who has an ear, let him hear. So he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, as Christians, we read in Romans chapter 6 that when Jesus died on the cross, that we as Christians died with him. That we've already died. And in fact, the baptism that we, the sacrament of baptism that we go through the process of going under the water and coming out of the water is symbolic of that relationship that we have. That we join ourselves with Christ and as he died, go under the water, then we died with him. But that's not the end. As he rose from the dead, as he came out of the water, then we also have already risen from the dead. And we have risen to a new life like Jesus Christ rose from the dead into a glorious body in which he was able to ascend to heaven, in which he was able to perhaps walk through walls or locked doors and do many amazing things. That is part of who we are now as Christians. That we have already died and we're raised from that death to live a new life as Christians that God has given us a new life that we walk in now. And again, there's that hope that we know that even this life that we live as Christians is not complete. It's something that we're working towards, that God is working in us until the day of his appearing. Until that day, we're continually moving forward, moving to be closer, to be more and more like Jesus. And so this second death that is mentions here is actually found in the back of the Revelation in the Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to read there if you don't want to flip it, that's fine. Um, talks about the uh, second resurrection, the great white throne judgment um, and the dead are brought before God and they open this book, the book of life and the dead were then j judged but they were judged by their works. But the last thing is they look to see, was their name written in the book of life? That's the last thing. Did they do some good things? Yeah, they did five good things. They did 300 bad things. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. But ultimately, they were judged by those things. And then they said, okay, the last thing is if your name's written in the book of life, you are good. If your name's not written in the book of life, forget it. And so in verse 14 um, of Revelation 20, it says, after all those things that were judged, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone who was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. You may have heard it said that if you're born twice, you only have to die once. We're born as the flesh. We die in the flesh. And in a sense, we die as Christians with Christ. And then we're born again. We're born a second time. We do not go through this second death. That is for the unbelievers, for the unsaved people, because their names are not written in the book of life. Our names are written in the book of life. So we are not hurt by that second death. And that's what this passage in Revelation 2 is alluding to. That's part of our process of overcoming. We're washed, we're cleansed, we're set to be a part of God. We look to this hope that we have this eternal life eating from the tree of life in paradise and we're not even going to be hurt by this second death that's going to approach the rest of the world. And so let's go on a couple of more verses down in chapter 2, verse 17. It says, To him who overcomes... I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. So manna. There's two parts here. Manna, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, as the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt, they wandered through the wilderness and... Um, I don't know if they brought their bow and arrow with them. Um, I know they came out with food and stuff, but pretty soon all of that stopped being available. 
you know, they, they ran out and they complained to Moses. They said, Moses, hey, you delivered us. You brought us out of Egypt and here we are hungry and thirsty and we're desiring to go back to Egypt where at least we had leeks and onions. Maybe there wasn't a McDonald's there, but, you know, hey, we had the life. I mean, it was slavery, but we were fed. Um, and so Moses went to God and he said, hey, they're complaining. And he said, okay, I will bring you this manna, which was like a, a seed, like a coriander seed that they ground up and made flour and bread from that. And they would get that every day. Overnight, the dew would fall and God would cause the manna to fall upon the earth and they would go out and they would collect that and they would make flour and bread every day except for the Sabbath day. But they didn't get any on the Sabbath day, but the day before they got a double portion. So they would be able to make a, twice as much bread to be able to feed them for two days. God also provided meat for them. So maybe they did have bow and arrows, I don't know. But they had like some kind of sparrows or some kind of birds that were brought to them um, and they were fed and there was water that came out of a rock and God provided for them. And even their clothes as they were traveling during that time did not even wear out. And they were journeyed there for 40 years in part because of their sin. Because they would not believe God. God tried to get them into the promised land sooner but they, they complained. And so he said, okay, well, if you're going to complain, if you're going to mumble and grumble, then uh, I'm not going to let you go into the book, the, in the book, into paradise, in the sense of going to Israel to take over Canaan. And so the generation of adults that came out of Egypt all died in the wilderness. And their children that were born to them in the wilderness those are the ones who actually made it into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb. All of the other people that came out of Egypt died during those 40 years. But their clothes didn't wear out, and they were fed, and they had everything provided for them, and yet still some of them were not happy. Still some of them complained and griped and so forth. And so God provided And then also he promised them a new name, a stone, a white stone. Again, white referring to purity and cleansing and a new name that God has given to us. And only you know it. Well, God knows it too. But nobody else knows this new name because we have this new life that is hidden within God. And it's not even fully revealed to us yet what it's going to be, what it's going to come about. What's, what is all of this new life in Christianity going to be once we're done being here on earth? I mean, we read in there about streets of gold and we read about praising God and we read about angels with harps. And I mean, we, there's so much more that we don't even really know yet about what is that life really going to be all about when we get there. But he has promised it to us. And that name that he's going to give us is a new name. So often we find our lives in this world and the name that we're associated with as being something that is stained. And, and it's been, you know, people talk about their rep, their reputation that has been harmed. And so many of us, we realize that the things we have done in our life prior to joining Christ we've done a lot of things that we're ashamed of we've done a lot of things that we would not want to tell everybody about all the things that we've done and the sins that we've done and even some of those things that we find ourselves still trapped in but God is going to give us a new name a new reputation in which all of the things are right and and one of the things I thought about we read through some parts in the in the Old Testament recently and we see as you read through that there were names that were given to the children of Israel where their names were significant. Um, and they were named sometimes because of the time that they lived in, that they were named after, you know, famine or prosperity or the river that was nearby. Um, 
we, uh, we find that, you know, in some of those cases, God did also change their name. And we're actually going to, I think I've got that later on. I don't know. I don't see it in my notes here. So we've given, uh, he's given us a new, oh, it is right here. There, sorry, you can't see my notes. They're kind of jumbled. Um, Abram. You may have heard of this guy named Abram. Um, he's not Abraham. He's a guy named Abram. And God called him from this land of Ur of the Chaldees, him and his wife Sarai. And he said, you go from where you are to this promised land that I'm going to give you. Now, the word Abram is a name that means the high father. His, his wife Sarai um, is one meaning contentious, troublesome. But God did change his name. And he did become Abraham, meaning uh, a multitude, a father of a multitude. And Sarah, her name was changed to Sarah, becoming a princess. And so God met them and changed their name when it was a significant time. Um, also, the grandson of Abraham, his name was Jacob, um, which means supplanter or a con man. His name was changed to Israel, a soldier of God, after he wrestled with God. And this is found in Genesis 32, if you're interested in that. And so many times we see these Old Testament saints where God called them by a name. Now, it's interesting to note that Jacob was a twin. He had a twin brother. Um, they were not identical twins. Um, his brother Esau was called Her Harry. Esau means hairy one. So Esau was called the hairy one because he had all this fur all over him when he came out and he was born. Um, and Jacob was called supplanter or heel catcher because when Esau was coming out, Jacob, who came out second, was gr holding on to his heel. Like, um, and so Esau did not have his name changed. Sorry. So it doesn't always happen, but occasionally it does. And in this passage here, we read in Revelation that we will receive a new name, that all of the things connected to our old name are then going to fade away. So uh, continuing back in Revelation 2, the next part here, um, overcomers, is found in verse chapter 2, verse 26. It says, He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed in pieces like the potter's vessels, as also I have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. So here, part of what we receive as overcomers, as children of God, as sons of God and daughters of God is this idea that God has given us power or authority over the nations. Um, this is also found, <clears throat> excuse me, in Revelation chapter 1, it mentions that uh, in verse five, 6, it says, He has made us kings and priests. Kings and priests to God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so there's this process by which part of what we receive as joining into the family of God is not just that we've been adopted and that we're kind of those second child or stepchild, but that God has not only adopted us, but called us to be his sons and daughters. That he has given us authority and it says here that, that um, as also I have received from my Father, speaking of Jesus, because these words are Jesus speaking through John. So Jesus received authority from the Father, and we have received that same authority. Uh, I have taught this before, but I want to take a look uh, quickly for another writing of John in the Gospel of John. In chapter 17... Uh, Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying. 
and it's a long prayer, but there are some significant things that Jesus prays about concerning you. Jesus was praying for you, about you, uh, and me, all of us. Um, and there's many verses here, but I just wanted to highlight a few of these things that he prays about the church. And at this point, it's kind of the future church. Um, he says that those you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Speaking of unity and uh, coming together, uh, this is found in John 17, verse 11. Um, and verse 14, it says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 18, as you sent me, so I have also sent to them. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect or complete in one. And the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. So it's kind of a deep thing, an interesting thing, that Jesus Christ here is declaring that not only are we those that are saved, brought in as part of the family of God, being Christians, but that there would be a deeper, intimate relationship that as Jesus was with the Father, he has received this authority, he has received this power, he's received this mission to go out and, and preach and teach and save the lost, that in all these things that where Jesus as Son of God has received these authority and these things from the Father, he says, those things he has also given us. It does not mean that we are little gods. God is in us, yes. But we ourselves are not gods. We are not creators of the universe. We did not pre-exist before time as Jesus did. But in, in most, many other aspects that we stand with the authority, with the power, with the privilege, with the position as Jesus did when he was on this earth. And in fact, Jesus, when he was saying goodbye to the apostles, the disciples, he said, if I don't go, then I'm not going to be able to send the helper the Holy Spirit. And he will come and he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to teach you. He's going to reveal things to you. But if I don't go, you won't get any of that. As much as you want me here, I have to leave so that he can come and be a part of you. And then at that point, when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we become a Christian, when we are born again, the Holy Spirit is like a seed that has been planted in us and begins to then grow to where it begins to fill us up on the inside so that there's less of me and more of him. And it's a process. Until that day on which Jesus Christ is revealed and we arise to be fully transformed and bust out of this shell so that our full spiritual form is revealed, um, or if we do not live until that day and we die and we're transformed when we are resurrected, that there is this part of God, the Holy Spirit, that is given to us, that is living in us, that is within us every moment, every second of the day, and every place you go and every experience you have, God is there. And there's just so much more. I can't even describe all the things but it's I think it's just an amazing thing and part of that here the second part it talks about he's giving us the morning star 
Now this passage, this, this idea of this morning star, um, in astronomical terms, um, there are a couple of different morning stars. One of them is referred to as Venus, who is actually a planet we know. But in the morning, very early morning, when you look to the east, you often can see Venus bright as while the sun is rising up before the sun becomes full. You can see Venus. It's like one of those first stars that you can see in the sky. Um, there's a couple of other ones that uh, also, you know, have that same position. Mercury is another one that sometimes you can see. And it looks like a very, very bright star, but it, we know it, it being a planet. Um, but the Bible talks about in Revelation 22, 6, that Jesus himself is the bright and morning star. And so, again, this idea that part of what we're receiving as overcomers is Jesus himself. In fact, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. That we receive Him Himself. You know, and, and I remember even when I was younger, they talk about receiving Jesus into your heart. That He does come. Not just into our heart, but of our whole being. That we receive Jesus Himself. is this bright morning star expressing that brightness and the newness of the day within us. And again, that's something that we receive, all of us, as overcomers. That we get to have Jesus with us and in us for eternity. And he is on our side, in our corner. And even his very essence inhabits our being as Christians. Paul writes it in this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Revelation 2, 5, we find it written, uh, is that? No, that's not Revelation 2, 5. Hmm. Wow, I wrote that down, but I don't know where that is. Huh. Well, oh, it's Revelation 3, 5, that's why. We're going on to the next chapter. I'm like, why does it say that? Um, Revelation 3, 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So here again, we have this idea of our sins being covered, and that because of our, his blood washing out, that we actually are clothed in white. Again, symbolizing purity, that our stained garments have become white, and how our name is then securely written in the book of life. That he will not be, he will not be able, he will not blot out our name from the book of life, that we have that security, that blessed assurance, as the old hymn says, that we are with him and Jesus himself declares to all heaven to God and the angels he declares and witnesses before them that we are his he's not ashamed to be be with us he openly declares that we are his family and that we are with him 3 verse 12 he who overcomes I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. The pillar of God's temple, that we are going to be part of the building of God, a strong building, a part of his plan and purpose for the future. That's part of what we now have as being overcomers in Christ, that we are now part of God's plan. We're not just these people who are kind of over there as rocks, as the foundation, we're just, we're pillars. We're part of the strength of God's temple, of God's presence, of God's purpose upon the earth. And that's part of what he has given us, his Holy Spirit, is so that we now have the power, that dunamis, that dynamite power of God to be in us, to be a part of whatever it is that God is doing. And as a pillar, we form the building of God, the temple of God. 
and part of what God is doing in the future. He also says here that the names of God himself and Jerusalem are written on us as well as a new name for Jesus. So not only we have a, a new name, but it says here that Jesus is going to have a new name. A new name for Jesus as well. I don't know what that is. I guess I'll find out when I get there. That he will have a, his new name. Jesus will have a new name as well. It's interesting to think, um, if you're familiar with um, some older movies, there's this little guy named Woody. And uh, he was in this toy story. Um, and his, on his foot, on the bottom of his shoe, was written the name Andy in big, bold letters. A-N-D-Y. And that's because Andy owned Woody, that Woody belonged to Andy, that Woody was part of the family of Andy's toys. And so we have the name of God written upon us. In the New Testament elsewhere, it talks about the seal of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. In the book of Revelation, it talks about those who are sealed with the Spirit of God, that the devil is not able to or the Antichrist is not able to come against them. And so we have that name of God written upon us. But not only that, it's interesting. It says about the name of the city of New Jerusalem. And you read that in the... We haven't got that far in the book of Revelation yet, but there's a new city of Jerusalem um, that is coming down from heaven in which we will then live there in the future... Um, and that's the part where it talks about that this new city of Jerusalem has streets of gold. Not all of the earth has its streets of gold, but at least this city does. And it's kind of interesting. My, my wife and I recently moved, and we had lots of boxes with lots of stuff in them. And we had the forethought to write things on the outside of the boxes. So we got all these boxes that all look the same, and it's like, okay, what is in, what is in each box? And, and my wife even got these little stickers that we were able to put on the boxes that says this box goes to this room or the kitchen or wherever. And things were written on the box so that we open them up and like, oh, okay, that, that, that's what it says. And it's not only just saying who it is and who it belongs to, but where, what is the destination? And I think that's kind of neat. That our destiny, our destination is securely written upon us. So if we ever get lost we'll know that we belong to God and that we're going to this new Jerusalem. Okay, so don't worry. It's written on you somewhere in Magic Ink. Okay. Um, verse 21 in chapter 3. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And again, I, I, this emphasis on, on the likeness of Jesus Christ and how we have become part of the family of God but so so much more than that it says that Jesus here has been given the authority to sit on the throne with his father I have no qualms with that whatsoever that's the other part of that 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 I'm just amazed by that it says that we sit on the throne with Jesus and his father you, me, that we're sitting on the throne of God with him. And, and I don't know what, what that all is going to look like. But I know it's not a little thing. And I just want to emphasize part of this idea of sitting. And I couldn't find it, but I, I'm pretty sure I remember somewhere it says about Jesus standing and praying and interceding for us. I just couldn't find that scripture for whatever when I was looking for it. But part of the idea of sitting is that it is completed, that it is done, it is finished. That when all the things have been working and when all the work is going on and then finally you get to the point where you get to sit because it is done, it is finished. All the work has been completed. And I think that's part of this idea that we have that authority that we are sitting with God. 
that we are with him like I read in, in John 17, that there is this essence of us and Jesus and the Father that, that we should be one with one another and that we are one with Jesus in the same way that Jesus is one with the Father. Now, we don't fully understand the whole Trinity thing with the Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father, but we know and understand that they are God, that each one of them is separate and yet they are God. And the Bible then declares that we are one with them as Jesus is one with the Father. I don't understand how that works. But I think in part it's because of the Holy Spirit that has attached itself to us. And so we are connected through the Holy Spirit to Jesus in the same way. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God, that he is with you, in you. Um, and I wanted to just quickly read from 1 John, again, you don't have to turn there, but I wanted to mention this is spoken of another book by John, written in 1 John chapter 3. Be Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. As he is, so are we in this world. It says, as he is. As Jesus is, in authority, in the throne, and the, the arrangement, the, the position that he has with God the Father, so are we in that place. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we have that position, we have that place. We shall be like him. And this hope is something that purifies us. This hope in us that's part of the eternal life that we are yet to have. That zoe is the Greek word, speaking of this, this new life that we have, the eternal life that is in us, until that day approaches, until that time comes. And I have in here verse chapter 13. Um, of Revelation. I just wanted to read a couple of parts here and then we're going to go and we're going to run over to Ruth. Okay? So, Revelation 13, and this is part of what this started for me. Revelation 13, verse 10. In chapter 13, it talks about the beast and the Antichrist and about those um, who dwell on the earth will worship this beast whose names have not been written in the book of life. And the very end of, of this passage. Um, in verse 13.10, it says, Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I was like, wow, that's interesting. What does the Antichrist and the beast have to do with the patience and the faith of the saints? But then it's again in chapter 14, found in chapter 14, verse 12. Again, right before this, it's talking about the Antichrist and the, and the beast who, who rises and those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name and how they're going to be condemned. And it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And it dawned upon me, like I said earlier about the hope that we have, we have this hope of eternal life that is yet to come. That we're living this life now that sometimes seems like it's a chore and sometimes just a bore and certainly a trial and a trouble and a tribulation that we find in our physical body sometimes. The stresses of the life around us. And yet we have that hope that Christ in us is part of this hope that we have a future glory that we will at one point we have overcome we will at one point see that overcome come to full fruition that that's part of this Christian life is we do not see and feel and understand all of that stuff now but we do know that there is a day coming when he is revealed that we will be like him that we will we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ in fact, in the book of Ephesians, it says that we're already there spiritually. We're already in this position of having authority and, and position with God and his son, Jesus, on the throne and with power and authority. 
And so this is where I wrote earlier about the word beloved. I actually had heard it preached on the radio. This guy was talking about the word beloved. And it, it, it all came together for me in the book of Ruth. As we've been reading on Wednesday nights, actually we just finished the book of Ruth. So you can listen to the messages online. Uh, we just started the, the first chapter of Samuel last week on Wednesday. And Ruth chapter 2 um, is the passage... Um, so if you want to find that while I give you a little recap. In the book of Ruth, Ruth was the um, Gentile woman from Edom who uh, was married to a Israelite man, um, Naomi, um, and her two sons went to Edom because there was a famine in the land and they went to this other country to survive. And while they were there, her two sons uh, married Gentile wives. Now, this was not a thing that they should have been doing. They should have not engaged in that process of intermarrying with Gentiles. Um, but they did, and God had his mercy upon them, except these two sons of Naomi both died while they were there. And uh, she said, well, my sons have died, and you, you know, women... You should go back to your families. I'm going to go back to Israel because things have changed there. And the one daughter-in-law said, okay, bye. Uh, but Ruth said, no. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. That your people are now my people and your God is now my God. And she declared that she would be part of Naomi's life from there forward. And so they returned back to Israel, and things were not great. It was not all buckets of roses and wonderful blessings upon them. Naomi was quite disturbed, actually, and um, was not a happy person coming back, but... You know, she did her best, and Ruth followed the instructions of Naomi, and they did not have property. They did not have stuff. They did not have position. Um, and perhaps partly because Ruth was this Moabitess. She was this Gentile wife. And so the only thing they did have is they could go and glean. So Ruth would go and follow after the reapers of the harvest and when they were reaping their grain they would leave parts of it behind or part of it would fall to the ground and then that was available for the poor or people who destitute or in you know whatever it means that they didn't have enough to have their own and so she would go in and gleaning after the workers had cleaned the field and this is where we find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2 verse 5 that she happened to be in the field of Boaz. And so, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And so the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves, so she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Verse 8, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be upon the field which, which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. 
And so we find here this story of Boaz who took Ruth in and, and not only let her reap, but almost made him as one of the servants, made her as one of the servants that she, and in fact, we read later on that he told his servants as they were gleaning to purposefully leave behind stuff and maybe even drop stuff on the ground so that she would be able to get it. We also find that Boaz was a relative, a relative of Naomi, and therefore by marriage a relative of Ruth. And he found and understood her position as being this nowhere person. She had no property. She had no rights. She had no position. She, had n she was, found herself kind of in no man's land as being some, somebody, you know, as a Gentile and just with nothing. But he recognized his position as one who, as a relative, that he could redeem her that he could declare, and he did declare, that she would then become part of his family and the, his wife. That he would redeem her from this lost position so that she would then be reclaimed as having position in the family and in the children of Israel. And in fact, we read in Ruth uh, chapter 3 at the very end, Naomi says, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. That he was determined to get this done and take care of her so that she would not become abused by other men or, or whatever, that she would not be lost and left alone. And then he took her before the elders and declared her to be his wife. And that she would receive all of the authority, the position, that his name would allow. And so that while she was loved, she then became beloved. And so like us, God so loved the world, the billions of people that live in the world, God loves them all. But they are not all beloved. It's only us who have chosen to love him back in return and receive the gifts and the offerings that Jesus Christ has given to us in the shed blood and the washing of our sins and the position that we have come to because we are overcomers, that we are no longer just love, but we are the beloved. The ones who have come to this position of receiving the seed of God through the Holy Spirit in us. And he has secured our future. And like Ruth, so often we find ourselves asking why. Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? And it's because of the love of God. And as that day approaches, we also find ourselves in that position as part of the family of God that we have been joined in, we have been grafted in, Paul writes, into the family of God, into the tree of the family of God, so that we are now fully part, partakers, partners of the work of God, of the promise of God, of the future of God here on this earth and to the future and beyond. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, not because of anything we've done, not because we've done anything except our heart declaring loyalty and faithfulness to God, and God has done everything else. We have received such a bounty, such a blessing, and it's not having to do any bit from us at all. But he has loved us and has called us to be his beloved and called us to this intimate relationship in which we do have all of these things. And in part, like I said, that seed is growing within us, the Holy Spirit is growing within us until at some point it's gonna just burst forth, replacing us with himself until we see us no more and we are more like him from glory to glory as that day approaches. Amen. So I, I ask then of you, if you have received Jesus Christ, then take this 
take this. Take these things and, and the things that God has given as overcomers. You have it. You have all these things. And hold on to those things and, and ignore, maybe not ignore, but let the hope and the patience of God be with you through the trials and the struggle, through the hardships, through the heartaches, until that day comes when we will see it fully revealed. In the meantime, we just need to hold on and allow God to be with us and in us and through us. And if you've not done those things, if you've not received Jesus Christ, the day is approaching when it will be too late. And you just have to receive that gift from Jesus Christ. Receive the things that he has done upon you and you can be an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony as well as we all. So we're going to sing some additional worship songs. And I ask if you want to come forward and pray. Um, Tony is here. She will pray with you as we sing. Um, but go and be with God. Because God is with you. And allow that reality to immerse yourself into his presence as we go through this life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah,